Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Watchmen Talk, a series of conversations with military, intelligence, and diplomatic experts and practitioners. And our special guest uh, today is retired Colonel Richard Kemp, uh, CBE. Is that the right? I believe so, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, um, formerly of the British Army, also uh, with the Cabinet Office, the so-called COBRA cell, which we will go into uh, later. But first of all, uh, because our viewers are probably curious about uh, those interesting uh, habits that uh, you uh, in the empire have, what, what does Commander British Empire stand for? It's, um, the, there's a thing called the Order of the British Empire, which was established in, nine, I believe it was 1917, during the, second, during the First World War. And it has a number of different levels, one of which is commander of the Order of the British Empire. And uh, military people get a, a particular version of it, which is the military division of the Order of the British Empire. Uh, and, and the CB, in my case, was awarded for my service during my work in the British Cabinet Office working on international terrorism. So does the OBE, CBE and MBE? It's o, it, the lowest is MBE, member. The next is OBE, officer. The next is CBE, commander. And then uh, KBE, knight commander. And I'm then, waiting for the night commander. And then, and then you get to be called sir? Yes, you do. You do. Uh, so you're one step... Uh, I'm one step below. ...short of them. Yeah. Um, you can still you, call me sir. Right. And, <laughs> and you um, may still get it. So, sir, uh, Colonel, um, you were born um, a year before national service was abolished um, in Britain. Right for the first uh, 15 years after World War II, there was still mandatory um, service for 18 yeah. months or so. But um, when you graduated from from high school or the equivalent, um, this was um, years after you didn't uh, have any obligatory service. That's Wh right. Why did you choose a military career? I like to say that I um, it was either join the army or go to prison. Um, but actually, that's not quite the truth. I, I, I was always going to be a soldier. That was the thing I, 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 I fixed on at a very young age. I don't know why, but it was the case. And I enjoyed playing soldiers at school, and the, the natural progression was to become a soldier. So Did, it was always something I was going to do. But was your uh, family uh, with a military background? My, my father served in the Second World War uh, as, a, as a conscript soldier, and his father the same in the First World War. So there was a bit, but it, we didn't so have you any joined professional for, background. you joined for the Third World War. I, I joined, and, and I found it. <laughs> um, and was that, uh, was that a, an urban background, um, a farming uh, country uh, side where you grew up in? I, I grew up in a relatively small town in, in Essex on the east coast of England. My father was a master mariner, and I spent quite a lot of time at sea or in boats um, during my childhood and, and early adulthood. So uh, it was it was more rural, I think, than urban. So why not uh, the navy? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I never, I never, it never really occurred to me actually the navy. I did, I didn't really like the idea of being confined to a ship. I preferred to be able to move around the countryside as as the army does. And now you live in Liverpool. I don't know. I live in Colchester. Which is um, in southeast England, and it's it's the oldest town in England. No, even if you ask an English person, they probably don't know that. But it's an old Roman town, and it's actually the largest garrison, military garrison town in the UK at the moment. Okay, so you joined uh, in 1977, um, I believe. Um, yes. Is that still under the old regimental system? Yeah, I, I left school one day, high school, and I joined the army the next day. I didn't go to university. Um, I was very, I, I wasn't at all academic. I didn't enjoy academic work and I couldn't face university. So I went straight into the army and I went into my local regiment, which was called the Royal Anglian Regiment, still is today, which is an infantry regiment which recruits from the eastern counties of uh, the UK, made up of about nine former old regiments uh, from the old style British army. But yeah, the regimental system existed then and still exists and is a very strong part of the British Army today. Does that mean that um, unless you go uh, to um, uh, a special forces unit or, or uh, you have some other posting, 
your entire service is going to be spent uh, with this one regiment? Not, not really. I mean, in some cases it is. I mean, some, some people will join, let's say, at the age of 18, and they'll serve um, 22 years or whatever it is and stay in that regiment. That, that doesn't really apply to officers. I, I joined as an officer. Um, and, and officers will do different postings. So, for example, I spent time in an intelligence role in Northern Ireland during my service, away from the battalion. Uh, I spent time working in the Ministry of Defence, again, away from the battalion. So you get different postings. I did a posting at our training depot, training new recruits coming into the army. So it's, it, it, it's your cap badge. You, you're, you're permanently affiliated with it. You normally return to your regiment when you finished another posting, but you... You move around quite a lot. So you get a direct commission and other people move up through the uh, enlisted ranks and uh, go to uh, officer candidate school and get their commission. What, what is the system? Yeah, I mean, I actually started, I, I did actually start as a private for a sh relatively short time. And then I went to Sandhurst, which is our equivalent to West Point, the military academy. Um, and, and from there I was commissioned. But it's it, the majority of people who are officers in the British Army, they will nowadays, they'll go to university and then they'll go to Sandhurst and they'll get commissioned straight away without any service in the ranks. But some, a relatively large number, can start off as a private, work their way up, maybe to corporal sergeant and get commissioned from there. Others will go right the way through the ranks to the most senior enlisted rank, which is regimental sergeant major. And, and then get commissioned from there. So it, there's a variety of different means of becoming an now, officer. Now, Sandhurst is um, a one-year course or, or multi-year. We, we know that King Hussein and many other Arab uh, leaders went uh, through Sandhurst. They believed, or their parents believed, that this is the best possible education for them. What was it in your case? Yeah, I, it's, it, when I did it, it was 14 months at Sandhurst. Um, it's it's normally it varies you know things change and the course changes etc but normally it is around a year which is distinct from let's say the American system of West Point which is you you, you generally I think spend four years there or more um, because you also get a degree a university degree at West Point that doesn't apply at Sandhurst it's purely a military training course there is academic content in it but it's it's really to turn you from being a civilian into being uh, an, an officer. Now, at West Point, uh, once uh, you are about to graduate, you choose your branch. And if you are in the um, upper 5% or so, um, you can get your pick. Otherwise, the uh, army chooses it yeah. for you. What was it in your case? Or, or was that because you already uh, enlisted in the uh, Royal Anglian Regiment? Uh, it was infantry from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I opted to join the Royal Anglian Regiment from the beginning, um, and I, I, I was selected to do so and got a commission in the regiment. Um, but it, it's a bit like West Point. In other words, the people who do best, generally speaking, will be able easily to go into a combat arm, like the infantry, the armoured corps, the engineers, the artillery. Um, but you've got to be pretty good at Sandhurst in order to be selected for one of those arms. Some people will, will choose not to go into those arms. They'll, they'll still be just as good, but they'll choose to go into something like the intelligence corps or another part of the army, a logistics element. Um, but it may be if you, if you don't quite make the grade for a combat arm, you might then be assigned to logistics or something else. Promotion would be faster in the combat arms. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think um, it's probably about the same. It's, it's, not, it's not a lot of difference in terms of promotion, but I think... What is true to say for those people who have a real ambition of getting to the very top of the army um, is that if you're in a combat army, you've probably got a better chance of getting to the most senior ranks in the army. Because, of course, the army, the British army, like the IDF, is all about fighting. That's what we're there for. That's what we're supposed to do. And therefore, the people who are directly involved in the fighting, like infantry, armoured corps, etc., they're the ones who, who, in my opinion, should be uh, leading the army, and, and most of the time do. Uh, is it more prestigious to serve in a particular combat branch uh, than, than the others, infantry over armour or the other way around? I would say infantry, without a doubt, and Royal Anglian Regiment in particular, but I'm, of course, biased. I don't, I don't think it is, really. I think it's, it, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're interested in being in a combat arm, then... Yeah, it, it could be any of them, and, and there's no. The, I, I would say the infantry is probably 
has the most, for example, former chiefs of staff of the army were infantry, I believe. Not, not exclusively, but most were, but that's probably more because it's the largest combat arm in the army. How about the uh, paratroopers? The, the para-regiment, of course, has a very storied uh, uh, history. Um, and the SAS, the um, Special Air Service, um, are you chosen for that um, right after, right out of centers? Um, the, the parachute regiment is a regiment like every other regiment in the army. So you might join, you might decide to join the Royal Anglian Regiment, you might decide to join the Royal Scottish Regiment, you might decide to join the parachute regiment. So you, 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 it, it, they're, they're pretty much on a par in terms of prestige and capability, etc. The parachute regiment, as you kind of allude to, has a sort of mystical reputation. But but in my the, the red berets, the red berets. But but it's it's the same as a as a normal uh, infantry regiment, really, with the exception of the fact they're they're trained to jump out of airplanes for some inexplicable reason. Why you get out of a serviceable airplane, I don't know. Um, in terms of special forces, special air service, for example. Um, you, you volunteer to do that if you want to. If you choose to go into the SAS, then when you probably when you're around maybe 23, 24, 25, 26, something like that, as an officer or a soldier, an, an enlisted man, you can, you can volunteer for that. You then go through a very grueling selection process. Now, uh, when you joined, um, uh, it was in the late 1970s already, uh, the British Army on the Rhine, uh, which used to be um, the most uh, important formation uh, if, should World War III erupt. Um, this was no longer really uh, the, the main event when you also had counterinsurgency in Northern Ireland. What was your career track? Yeah, I, 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 I spent about 10 years of my military service based in Germany. Um, preparing to defend against the Soviet army invading uh, Western Europe. And we spent a lot of time exercising and planning our defenses should that occur. Um, uh, that was our primary focus. You, you were supposed to defend the Fulda Gap or...? Yeah, there were various different deployment positions that we rec reconnoitred and we prepared and planned. No, no doubt, as in every war, it would have been completely different in reality. We'd have gone somewhere somewhere else. But entirely. in any event, the Germans, the inhabitants, would have paid a price. Yeah. Absolutely. Whoever won. Yeah, it was very much so, as always. But during my time in Northern Ireland, that 10-year period, I also did a number of tours, from, sorry, during my time in Germany, I did a number of tours to Northern Ireland from Germany. So wherever you are in the army, whether you're based in England, whether you were based in Germany or in other countries, you very often moved from there for six months. Individually seconded to the... Um... So, sometimes, but usually as a unit. So my regiment, for example, in Germany, I was there in 89. My regiment deployed to Belfast in 1989 for six months and then came back to Germany. So that was, that was a pretty standard way. I, I did, uh, uh, during my military service, I did about eight tours of duty in Northern Ireland, ranging between two years at a time and six months at a time. Um, so it was a big, it was a really big feature of my, certainly the early part of my career. Was it difficult for you? You are Catholic, right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you were obviously in Ulster, yeah. um, which is the Protestant part of, of Ireland. And um, obviously the troubles were between the uh, Protestant majority in Ulster, which is the minority in the entire yeah. uh, Isle, the Green, Green Isle. Uh, was it difficult for you uh, to, uh, to act there as an officer? Yeah, I mean, there was the, the, the conflict there over, over a 30-year period was pretty much uh, between um, the, uh, it, the, the there's, a, there's a large minority of Catholics in Northern Ireland, a growing minority now. Um, and then a small majority of Protestants. Uh, and the conflict was really um, fomented by the Irish Republican Army who wanted to get Northern Ireland out of the UK and reunite with the, with the, the entire uh, island of Ireland. And, and so, and the Irish Republican Army is a Catholic, it's not Catholic, it has no Catholic affiliations, but it's, it's Catholics who are, 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 are the terrorists in the organization and still are today, although it's changed its character. Sinn Féin. Right. Sinn Féin is the political element that controls the Irish Republican Army and did then and, and 
uh, pe people argue it's the other way around now, that the provisional IRA counts, army council controls Sinn Féin. At least that's what the police in Northern and Southern Ireland say. But in, uh, to answer your question, it wasn't difficult at all. I mean, the, 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 there's a minority of Catholics in the British Army, a pretty small number. Um, there's no restrictions or, uh, you know, uh, ban on them serving in Northern Ireland. It was a perfectly normal thing to do. But if they refused? I don't know of anyone that did. I don't think you'd be able to refuse. If you did, you'd probably, I would guess, be court-martialed or invited to leave, one of the two things. I don't know. I don't think there was any cases of that. But it, it wasn't really, it, it's, it, you know, I don't, it wasn't a question of, as, as Sinn Féin and the IRA tried to present and still do try and present today with increasing vigour, it, uh, it wasn't the British Army oppressing Catholics. It was the British Army preventing a civil war in Northern Ireland. And in fact, when we first went into Northern Ireland back in 69, the British Army was welcomed in above all by Catholics. It, that changed over time. But, and, and Catholics were quite hostile in, in some areas to, to British security forces. By the way, um, in the mid 1970s, the Syrian army was invited into Lebanon by the Christians, by right. the Maronites. Right. Later, uh, it turned around and, um, and they uh, tried to resist what they saw as uh, occupation. Yeah. But it only goes to show you that uh, once you invite someone in, you may regret it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. And I, I, I actually found myself as a Catholic in many ways at an advantage because, you know, you could, if, you, if you spoke to people in, in even the hardcore Catholic areas, if you were able to talk to them in a side road or outside the house or something, when, the, when there weren't too many eyes watching you, then they'd be frank and open and they'd often be friendly, whereas if there were people watching, they'd be hostile. And, and knowing that I was a, a Catholic, kind of, in some ways, it, it put me in a different, on a different footing. And they didn't see me as their great friend or something, but it was, you know, it kind of brought a different reality. They knew that you could empathize yeah, with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, um, obviously, the British Army um, has a long tradition of uh, countering insurgency or fighting guerrillas from Malaya on, um, and uh, its record uh, is considered better than the American one or, or other um, uh, countries which had no real experience uh, in, in colonial service. Um, was that also the case? in Northern Ireland, or was that a different experience altogether? I, th I think, f first thing I'd say is I, 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 I don't think that, that, that what you just said is, is the kind of accepted view, but I don't think it's right. I, 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 don't, I don't believe the British Army is better than, say, the Americans at dealing with insurgencies. Well, maybe now, after decades yeah, of okay. uh, being... But I, I, I think, you know, Br British people tend to be quite arrogant, and we will certainly say that, but I don't think it's necessarily true. But in Northern Ireland, I believe we did develop some very, very effective counterinsurgency methods. We made some huge mistakes. I mean, you just have to think about Bloody Sunday in 1972, when something like 13 people were killed who shouldn't have been killed. It's war. Soldiers do the wrong thing. They, there's confusion and chaos. You get some malignant soldiers as well who, who behave badly. So we, did, we made some mistakes, some significant mistakes during the, 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 the campaign. But we also had some phenomenal successes. I believe the British Army... And, and the police in Northern Ireland, the Royal Ulster Constabulary together, as well as our intelligence services, prevented an outright civil war in Northern Ireland. And the, I, I mentioned the word intelligence because intelligence is key here. And it was the intelligence penetration of the IRA, of the provisional IRA, in the really uh, in the 80s, 90s, that, that was very, very uh, strong, very strong. Human intelligence or signal intelligence? Both. Um, I would say, in, in that case, that both con both contributed. Probably human intelligence played a bigger role, um, and predominantly police intelligence. The Royal Ulster Constabulary Special Branch, which is their intelligence branch, was incredibly effective. They gained over the years, phenomenally effective, and their penetration, as well as British inter military intelligence and MI5 intelligence led, I believe, directly to the Good Friday Agreement. It led to the provisional IRA to realise they could no longer operate. They were literally almost unable to do anything without us knowing in advance. And now we are celebrating the 30th birthday anniversary of uh, the Good Friday 
uh, agreement. And by the way, uh, you probably know that uh, there was quite a link um, between the British uh, military experience in Northern Ireland during the original troubles more than a century ago mm. and the later um, the British experience in Palestine. Uh, people like uh, General Montgomery and others went back and forth and yeah. and tried to draw on lessons, yeah. um, trying to separate Jews from Muslims or from Arabs here as they as they did um, in in uh, Northern Ireland. Do you find that there are some uh, permanent lessons or similar lessons, uh, which regardless of the different circumstances, can be applied? Yeah, I think I think there are, and 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 they can apply. You know, lessons you learn from one military campaign, whatever it is, can be applied to another one. I think the big mistake people often make, and including British people, British Army people make, perhaps more than many, is is to kind of take the template and try and force it into a different situation. For example, um, in Afghanistan, the British Army, you know, we, we've got 30 years experience of this IRA campaign. And many people in the British Army thought you could just take Northern Ireland and apply it to Afghanistan. Completely wrong. But there were, there were commonalities, there were lessons. And when you speak about the, the links between this country, the Palestinian uh, Arabs and, and Britain, one thing that many people don't realize is the connections over the Northern Ireland campaign. And there were strong connections between Palestinian terrorists in, in, in this area and IRA terrorists. They shared technology, they shared um, tactics, they sometimes shared even, even equipment. And in addition to that, Libya under Colonel Gaddafi, Libya sent vast shipments of explosives, arms, weapons to Northern Ireland. And that, those, those things and other connections in this region led to very close cooperation between the British security forces and Israeli, particularly Israeli intelligence services, which was extremely beneficial for us in Northern Ireland. Now, um, Northern Ireland, um, as we all know, is, is one of the, the uh, uh, four members of the United Kingdom, along with England, Scotland and Wales. Why not have only constabulary forces, police there? Why reinforce it with the army? The, 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 the situation in 1969 was such that the, 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 the Royal Ulster Constabulary was unable to cope with the extent of civil disorder and developing terrorism. It started off really with more riots than anything else, but developed into terrorism, and the, the, the RUC was not able to not able to uh, cope with it. And, and I think the assessment was made by the government at the time that you couldn't assist by bringing in police from the mainland, from mainland UK into Northern Ireland. It wouldn't, there wouldn't have been enough strength or capability to overcome the problems. And so the army was seen as the, as the only real way of doing it. And that's why the army was brought in. And then from 1969 until I think it was 1978, something like that, the army took over responsibility for policing. It wasn't just in support of the police, the army led on policing for that period in Northern Ireland. I, I, I did my first tour in 1979, one year after military primacy ended. And again, we were supporting the police, but we still had a very, very strong role. And in many parts of Northern Ireland, the police really couldn't operate without British military support. And that was the case almost right the way up until the... the Was the it more thing. difficult in Belfast or in the other cities or in rural counties? Uh, it, the problems varied. Uh, I'd say Belfast and Londonderry, the, the Belfast being the capital of Northern Ireland, Londonderry being the second biggest city, um, had similar, similar problems and similar challenges. Belfast, probably because it's bigger, probably the greatest problem that we faced in, in Northern Ireland in terms of terrorist attacks, which were very frequent. But only in certain parts of Belfast. It was, it was quite bizarre, really. You could be in one part of Belfast living a normal day-to-day -day life as you can today in, most, in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or London. Um, and you go into another one, and it's a war zone. The, the rural areas, places like South Armagh, which is probably the most infamous of the... It was known as bandit country. Bordering... Uh... Bordering the south. And, and places like East Tyrone, Fermanagh, other rural areas in Northern Ireland 
were also extremely dangerous, and, and South Omar in particular. Uh, for example, during most of my, in fact, all of my service there, I served several times in South Omar, um, the, you, you, the army and the police could not move around in a vehicle. You had to either go on foot or in a helicopter because the threat of bombs against vehicles was so great. And it was you, a very dangerous part of the and world. And you lost brothers in arms there? Yeah. We, there, there were several members of my regiment were killed. In, on a tour in South Armagh, for example, there were, I lost three soldiers from my regiment, uh, all, all three, in fact, in two separate bomb incidents. At that time, you were a captain, a major? Uh, at that time, I was a captain. Now, we will get, in the second part of our conversation, we will get to your um, other postings. But um, just uh, to, to sum it up, um, fortunately, you didn't have to experience uh, a real shooting war against the Soviets, uh, for instance. But the British armed forces went into Falkland uh, in 1982. Was it your experience that the Northern Ireland diversion hurt uh, the real fighting when infantry had to go into the Malvinas or Falklands? Um, Because this is what happened with the Israeli yeah, defense forces in Lebanon. Yeah. I think the opposite is true, actually, because if, if, we, if we hadn't had that, I mean, the Northern Ireland experience, of course, was tragic, particularly for those people whose lives were in, in Northern Ireland, whose lives were kind of in turmoil and who were killed or wounded. Very great, very great tragedy. But for the British Army, it was beneficial. Yes, we lost soldiers, we had soldiers wounded, terrible things happened. But overall, the value of, of taking part in a low intensity war, I think certainly helped the British Army to improve its capabilities so this at is, high intensity. War. This is uh, where uh, we are going to pause and continue in the second part of our conversation. For the time being, Colonel Richard Kemp, CBE, thank you very much. And uh, this has been Watchmen Talk, the first part of a two-part conversation with Richard Kemp. We will be back soon. Shalom from Jerusalem.